Hello, everyone. Welcome to the panel discussion on the current standards of care in lung cancer. I'm Dr. Andrew So, Associate Director, Medical and Scientific Liaison Group in Abbott Diagnostics. I hope you have enjoyed the two pre-recorded presentations by Dr. Maison and Dr. Hanesh. So before we go into the panel discussion, I would like to quickly summarize the key points from these two presentations. We have heard that most lung cancer diagnoses are preceded by detection of a lung nodule by chest CT imaging. Now, while majority of these modules are still found incidentally, uh, screening detected modules are on the rise um, with an estimated 1.5 million nodules detected per year over an estimated 5 million people. Several landmark studies demonstrated that early detection of lung cancer is a powerful approach to reducing mortality and improving patient outcomes. Unfortunately, uh, lung cancer is often asymptomatic until later stages. Therefore, uh, screening of high-risk individuals uh, allows detection of lung modules that are or may become cancerous at a much earlier time point. <clears throat> While the NLST and the Nelson trials demonstrated the benefits of low-dose CT screening for lung cancer, the Dante trial did not find a significant benefit for low-dose CT screening. Furthermore, the potential benefit of screening is diminished by the uh, false positive CT results as a majority of the modules are benign, which could lead to unnecessary and potentially harmful invasive procedures. Now, several new uh, serum biomarkers currently under investigation are available to help detect early stage lung cancer. For example, um, plasma DNA levels. Uh, may improve the accuracy of CT screening for lung cancer. Now, it is also apparent that um, biomarker panels are more effective when combined with uh, parameters uh, for early detection of lung cancer. So that brings us now to this panel discussion, right? So this panel discussion is mainly focused on early detection of lung cancer. And today we are privileged to have three esteemed experts with us. We have uh, Dr. Darren Lim, who is the Associate Professor and Senior Consultant of the Division of Medical Oncology at National Cancer Center, Singapore. We also have Dr. Arjun Karna, uh, Senior Consultant in Interventional Pulmonology, Critical Care, Allergy, and Sleep Medicine at Yashoda Hospital in New Delhi. We have Dr. David Lam, who is a Clinical Associate Professor from Hong Kong University with interest in transitional uh, research and clinical trials. Unfortunately, Professor Lai could not be with us uh, due to some urgent matters. Okay, so, and now I would like to ask each of the panelists uh, to provide a brief on your current role in your institution in the diagnosis and management of lung cancer. So maybe we could start with Dr. Darren Lim, please. Hi, everyone. Um, I'm. I'm Dr. Lim, I'm a medical oncologist by training, uh, and uh, my focus has really been in lung cancer and head and neck cancers. My day job is a medical oncologist, um, but I also moonlight as uh, the research director for uh, the Lung Sing Health uh, Lung Disease Center, which brings together uh, the multidisciplinary uh, groups in uh, in uh, Sing Health Singapore Health Services, uh, and uh, I also am the coordinating PI for a lung cancer screening study in Singapore, specifically looking at incorporating biomarkers, emerging biomarkers into LDCT screening uh, protocols for both traditionally high-risk uh, groups as well as uh, low-risk populations. Thank you. Dr. Arjun? Yeah. So being a pulmonologist, you know, in India, I work as a multi-purpose worker. I have to coordinate between the patients, the oncologists. So my job begins at suspecting lung cancer when the patient walks into my OPD. And, you know, as a pulmonologist, you order scans. And when you read them, our basic job is to provide tissue. So we do a lot of interventional pulmonology procedures. I'm in charge of the interventional pulmonology labs. So I do bronchoscopies, e-bust, thoracoscopies. 
and we give the tissue to our pathologists and our medical oncologist colleagues. And apart from that, giving them the tissue diagnosis, we do a lot of, you know, we help them in managing the complications of these patients, putting in pleural catheters, you know, if they have any paraneoplastic syndromes, managing those, taking care of the clinical profile, the clinical management of these patients in India, most of the times would be done by a pulmonologist in, you know, conjugation with a medical oncologist. And that is what we do. We diagnose our patients, we give the tissue for diagnosis, and then we step in to manage these patients with our oncology colleagues. That's what I do with my patients of lung cancer. Thank you. Dr. David Lam. Oh, thank you. Um, I'm a pulmonologist by training and um, I have a research interest in um, lung cancer. So uh, besides those different respiratory illnesses like COPD, interstitial <laughs> lung disease, I also manage patients who have lung cancer and at the same time doing laboratory, translational, and also clinical trials in patients with lung cancer. And I also do the um, some of the intervention um, procedures for patients like EBUS and, um, and autofluorescence bronchoscopy. And um, as a pulmonologist, we do receive a lot of uh, referrals uh, for incidental finding of um, lung nodules. And um, so we have to, uh, we are uh, very eager to develop um, biomarkers or um, management protocols for patients who just been referred to us for management of lung nodules for further investigation. And um, I'm running um, also um, we just studies and I've joined the, um, the International uh, Lung Screening Consortium um, steering the uh, lung screening projects in uh, high-risk smokers with the um, pan-Canadian groups and also the Australian groups and um, the screening patients um, uh, screening high-risk smokers in the local population for early detection of lung cancer. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Great. So now I would like to pose uh, the first question to Dr. Arjun, right? We know that the early detection of lung cancer can lead to better and faster decision making and effective planning of treatment. So what are the current uh, challenges in the early diagnosis of lung cancer in your practice um, in India? And what is your opinion on overcoming these challenges? Fabulous. So, Dr. Andrew, as you said, you know, the early presentation of lung cancer, the early symptoms of lung cancer are very often missed. And most of the times in India, patients come to us when the disease is already metastatic. You know, the majority of our patients, we just analyzed our group, majority of what we do, 78% of patients in my practice are already stage four by the time they come to us. And 22% are 3B already. So, you know, in India, most of the times we are looking at palliative care for our patients with lung cancer. The biggest problem is because the symptoms are non-specific. And in India, if someone gets a nodule on a CT scan or a chest X-ray, most of the times the primary diagnosis is given as pulmonary tuberculosis or some kind of a chest infection. So the biggest challenge in my practice is before patients come to us, invariably the patients have been on three months, four months of anti-tubercular therapy. Patients have been empirically being treated for TB and other lung infections. And by the time they come to you, the patient is already has, you know, they have advanced disease. Another big problem in India is that we do not have a formal screening program in our country. You know, whether it is high risk patients or other patients, there is no insurance backup. There is no formal government or private sector program when, you know, you try and screen high risk patients. Different universities, different hospitals have tried to follow the Nelson project and, you know, accordingly screen patients. But then most of the times, because there is no impetus, there is no support to do that. So most of us have tried to run screening programs, but unfortunately, majority of them fell flat. So we were not able to really do it. When it comes to the peripheral parts of the country, the interiors of the country, there is problem in the availability of low-dose CT scans, in the availability of, you know, bronchoscopy suites. So a lot of these patients would be treated empirically only on the basis of a chest X-ray or a sputum examination. And availability of CT scans in a lot of part of our country would be a big problem. And even if a CT scan is done, 
and the patient shows an incidental nodule or you know something that looks like a mass lesion majority of these patients would still not be referred to us for tissue diagnosis they would be given a trial of att anti tuberculous therapy for at least 2 3 months before you know they actually start developing bad symptoms and then they would be referred to a pulmonology practice for further evaluation another problem dr andrew here is that even if you pick up you know early lung cancer you pick an up you pick up a nodule you've done a pet ct in a high risk patient and you see that you know there is a nodule and it looks bad to you it looks suspicious there's this problem of availability of thoracic surgeons we you know even in a city like delhi which is the capital city of my country i can count on my fingers the number of people who do you know lobectomies the number of people who do open thoracotomies or vat surgery now when you compare that to the rest of the country these data is going to be even worse so even if you pick them up early there are not many places that you can send them to wherein you know people can do something to actually help the patient to give them a tissue diagnosis to do a thoracotomy or to do a vat procedure and take out the nodule and tell us what we are dealing with so there are a lot of problems you know when it comes to picking up early you know lung cancer in this part of the world and to overcome this challenge well it's it's going to take a lot of time we need to first sensitize our physicians especially the ones the general physicians the gps who are working in the peripheries in the interiors of the country that not everything that they see on the chest x ray is pulmonary tuberculosis they need to be you know told to think about lung cancer in the first place and that it is a big problem in our country if you look at the morbidity and mortality due to cancers in india lung cancer is the number one cause of mortality in our country but even then it is unfortunately missed we need to open the government agencies and the bodies to start some kind of a screening program which is suitable to our country and when i talk about that you know i'm not talking about something which is very high fangled which would include something like radiology or which would include low dose cts because in our country that would not be feasible so hmm. i think in my country if this program has to take up if we need to pick up lung cancer early apart from sensitizing our physicians we need to have a blood marker the ideal blood marker would be something that would not only give you the diagnosis of lung cancer but would also tell you the stage of the disease and would also tell you what kind of a lung cancer you are dealing with but as of now it seems like a distant dream but if i could you know sum it up in one go in india patients are not averse to getting blood tests and you know getting a ct scan at times for our patients is difficult so if there is a biomarker which we can do early if there is something which is you know which has been proven scientifically that it works i think that would solve a lot of our problems in my country okay thank you is that also the same experience in singapore and hong kong maybe we try hong kong first <laughs> oh um we share the similar experience with um um in the set in terms of the um um the problems that dr kana has mentioned and uh, we have a high prevalence of um tuberculosis or old tuberculosis um in this part of asia not limited to india uh, not limited to hong kong and now uh, indeed i can tell you um the first abnormal low dose ct uh, results that i've got in my uh, in the screening program that i've run was actually a patient with tuberculosis so um tuberculosis is one problem the uh, other one i would think of is um we definitely need a um better biomarkers in uh, screening the target population so um we may be talking about smoking who as um one of the major risk factors in um identifying subjects for screening for early detection but at the same time we also have a prominent group of patients with lung cancers who are indeed lifetime never smokers and we don't have good going biomarkers or um uh, uh, clinically identifiable risk factors for them so uh, um in those situation um we need um also biomarkers to help in um better defining who to screen and how we screen okay dr lim um yeah i think um i think it would this experience be fairly similar uh in terms of the uh 
you know, we have guidelines uh, introduced in just recently last year on uh, low dose CT screening for uh, high risk individuals. Um, but again, you know, how much of it is being embraced and actually taken up by the the public? I think that's uh, something that is uh, not very apparent. Um, getting them to that first CT for the high risk population, I think probably is going to be the first obstacle that we need to get to. And then subsequently to adhere to subsequent uh, screening, um, low dose CT screening, uh, if they pick up something, and then subsequently getting them past that obstacle of uh, going on to interventional uh, biopsies and to prove wh whether or not they have cancer. I think these are all uh, common obstacles that we, we, we uh, see. And having a biomarker that could potentially uh, enrich or suggest a higher probability of uh, cancer and then combining that with the low dose CT screening may be the way forward. Okay. So talking about a high risk population, right? I mean, you know, um, Dr. Messions, um, in his lecture, he mentioned about 30% of lung cancer in Southeast Asia are non smokers, right? So, you know, um, and, and in, if that is the case, right, um, you know, who, who are these high-risk people that we should be looking out for other than smokers, right, which is the obvious case? Are you addressing it to anyone in particular? Um, any, anyone? <laughs> I'll take the first bite uh, since... Uh, okay. Uh, okay, uh, so I think the... the that proportion actually may be higher than 30%. You know, for, for us, probably around half of the patients would be or more, could be not never smokers. And uh, mm. I think uh, the Taiwanese group did try to address that in some way. But in, in the talent study, they uh, enriched for uh, a family history of uh, lung cancer in, uh, I think, up to second degree relatives. Uh, enriched for uh, exposure to secondhand smoke or cooking fumes using a cooking index. Uh, mm -hmm. And also, uh, and uh, together, that seemed to improve uh, their low dose CT screening rate uh, compared to uh, purely a low dose uh, CT screening uh, uh, strategy. Um, so I think that could be one way to go in terms of uh, using a clinical algorithm to uh, pick up these uh, patients at risk. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. All and, right. Uh, I, agree, uh, yeah, I agree with yeah. Dr. Lim and um, the um, talent study in Taiwan actually um, did get a better um, detection rate of um, lung cancer from um, the um, the European trials of um, around one point something percent, um, they've got um, slightly more than 2% of detection with those enrichment. Yeah, 2.4, I think, 2.5. Yeah, 2.45 something. And, um, but it's still um, low. And um, we definitely are facing a very unique population in the um, South, um, in, in the Asian part here. And um, indeed, um, it varies with the um, smoking prevalence in the population. In Hong Kong, we only have a 10% of a smokers in the population. So um, we are bound to face a lot of uh, patients who, have, who will have lung cancer um, found or diagnosed or detected early uh, from non-smokers. So there is an urgent need to identify a good going biomarkers to try to um, uh, help screening for um, or early detection of lung cancer in this part of the road. Okay. Thank you. All right. So that brings us to the next question. Um, so the next question I'll direct to Dr. David. Uh, so, you know, you did mention that there, you know, that is a use of biomarkers. So, um, you know, what in, in your opinion on the use of biomarkers in the era of low dose CT? You have just alluded to it a little bit. Maybe can you expand a little bit more? And, um, you know, on the same vein, right, we are talking about low dose CT. Um, so what is your opinion on the pros and cons of using low dose CT in early detection of lung cancer? Uh, what I believe is um, low dose CT is a good 
an effective way of um, uh, screening for lung cancer as an initial tool. But um, it's good in the sense that it's effective not only in finding something, but in finding a lot of different things, including those indeterminate lung nodules, uh, tuberculosis, or a, even some supplies that sometimes to us, uh, besides those lung nodules that are eventually diagnosed to be lung cancer. So that's why is again, it's good and not good enough tools that um, is not that specific that it only tells you there is something abnormal there. You need, for example, subsequent, subsequent work of pulmonologists or intervention pulmonologists to get the tissue for the diagnosis or even to, to make it, uh, um, to uh, diagnose it away from lung cancer, whether it is TB or other pathology. So um, it's good as an initial screening, but we need, um, uh, our, what we say are uh, complementary tools in the subsequent workup when something has been found on the low dose CT is um, is good, uh, but the um, availability in some countries, as Dr. Kana mentioned, would be another issue. So um, mm. the workup is another issue, and um, that the uh, another issue that I've alerted to. Um, in um, the previous discussion is that low dose CT is not um, what we say um, specifically um, useful for a particular population. It's um, designed for general purpose. So um, it appears to be good in different populations, just like in the Caucasians or in Asians, but at the same time is again not specific um, towards um, the population characteristics or the so-called high-risk population. So um, if we have an additional biomarkers to um, go with low-dose CT or to follow when something has been found on low-dose CT, that would be good. And when I say biomarkers, it's not limited to blood biomarkers, but it could be other biomarkers like some of the radiological features. For example, now the CT can say whether the nodules um, actually um, calcified in nature, whether they're ascemic solid, whether they're ground glass components or, or a wholly solid component. Sometimes that, um, among other features of the textures, could act as a biomarker as to guide subsequent investigation. For example, if they are mostly calcified, most of the time we believe that they are the results of um, old tuberculosis. For indeed, if some of them has a significant ground grass, um, what is it, ground grass a component, then we would be more worried and uh, we need to be more aggressive in the subsequent intervention or um, management. Concerning um, low dose CT, when I say it's good as an initial tool, um, there are two situations to arise. One is when it found something for you. Then you go on investigations, as we have mentioned. But another issue is when the low dose CT is not giving you anything. It's, for example, it's telling you that it's normal. So what's the subsequent um, frequency to screen? what will be the appropriate frequency to screen subsequently. For these uh, high-risk populations, just like the situation with um, colorectal tumors, sometimes um, the um, colorectal surgeons uh, or the, um, the current guidelines will recommend in high-risk individuals, um, they have to have um, colonoscopic surveillance in subsequent years. But we don't have such ideas, such information when it comes to low-dose CT for lung screening. So, um, so I would say low-dose CT is a good as an initial tool, but we need um, the uh, complementary tools and subsequent workup in order to make it useful for uh, screening and early detection of lung cancer. Great, great, thank you. So, okay, so moving on to the, you know, um, describing the tools, right, which you just mentioned, maybe I'd like to ask um, Dr. Darren Lim, 
right? Given that uh, risk stratification of high-risk patients can be a game changer, as you mentioned, for early detection of lung cancer. What is your opinion on risk stratification tools uh, for detection of lung cancer at early stages and the potential role of newer biomarkers in uh, risk stratification of high-risk patients? Dr. So we, we can't hear you. <laughs> okay, yeah. sorry, I muted myself. Uh, it's, it's, a, it's a great question, uh, Andrew. Um, I think uh, risk stratification tools in the form of minimally invasive biomarkers, as alluded to by Dr. Kana and uh, Dr. Lam be before, are going to be uh, potential game changers. Um, you know, you would allow us to perhaps enrich and even uh, high within a high risk population pick up most are even higher risk uh, for uh, potential uh, cancer and uh, direct the uh, appropriate uh, limited medical interventions to that particular group. Um, you know, I, I personally favor perhaps some breath or blood-based biomarkers that have been specifically designed uh, with detecting early stage lung cancers in mind. I, I think the broad uh, pan-cancer approaches such as GRAIL, um, may be a bit more challenging um, as the biomarkers may not be fit for purpose nor necessarily applicable to early stage uh, disease. Um, I think a very nice biomarker which was uh, recently reported in uh, World, I think in one of the a uh, IASLC meetings uh, comes from Onc Immune uh, and uh, this was a randomized controlled trial uh, which will involve about 12,000 individuals in Scotland. And uh, what they actually showed, um, and this was a high-risk population uh, for patients who are at high risk of developing lung cancer, and they were able to demonstrate that more people were detected with early lung cancer in the in intervention arm, the screening arm, compared to the standard arm of just observation. I think the numbers were about 41% versus 26%. And this also reduced the late stage lung cancer detection, uh, late stage lung cancer uh, 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 deaths uh, uh, at, at two years in the in the intervention arm. So um, I think this is a very nice demonstration of uh, of uh, the utility of a uh, of a blood based biomarker uh, together with a low dose CT uh, in in in, in a. Uh, high risk population. The caveats of this trial being that this is only one trial, and we had, haven't really repeated it in another population uh, in, in a similar design. And uh, the question again is it applicable to Asian population? This was a totally uh, Western Scottish population. And does the panel perform any differently in Asians? Does it perform the same for, uh, say, uh, a lower risk population, a lifetime never smoker population? I think these are questions that remain to be answered, yeah. Okay, thank you. All right, so now uh, I'm going to ask each of you panelists a question, uh, and I would like you to provide a yes, no answer um, with a short justification for your answer, okay? Are you ready? Let's start with Dr. Arjun, right? Um, okay. Uh, do you think non-invasive methods uh, like biomarkers are easy to implement and are effective tools for screening of lung cancer? Yes or no? So despite being an interventional pulmonologist, my answer is yes, because at times, you know, especially in the COVID era, you want to probably not do as, as much intervention, you know, as we used to do. We are now moving away from interventions. We want to delay it as much as possible. And of course, at times, you know, it is not always economically feasible the logistics sometimes, especially in our country, do not allow us to do biopsies. A lot of patients who have lung cancer, unfortunately, the elderly smokers, they would also have severe COPD, IPF, ILD, mm -hmm. and subjecting them to an interventional pulmonology procedure or an open surgery for diagnosis at times is not possible. So yes, if there is a simple way out, a blood or a breath-based test, which can complement us in the diagnosis of lung cancer, the ideal would be if it can also tell us the prognosis and the type, the subtype, the histological subtype of the lung cancer. But then that's thinking out, that's thinking out loud and thinking out too far. But yes, of course, if there is such a biomarker, absolute thumbs up would be absolutely welcome. 
Okay, thank you. Right, so um, the next target, <laughs> Dr. Darren Lim. Okay, so uh, I'm going to give you a statement and uh, you let me know whether you agree with this statement or not, right? Uh, so it says, repeat CT is not an effective and robust approach for screening of lung cancer. Do you agree with this statement, yes or no? Uh, I don't agree with the statement. I think it can be an effective tool, but it needs a lot of work. Um, I think studies have shown that if we can get the patient to the first CT, um, and they will adhere to potentially annual screening programs. We also know that in certain developed countries, um, the ISA for, for uh, such uh, uh, low-dose CT screening is quite cost-effective um, and acceptable for these countries to implement on a broad scale. Um, I think also, you know, but I think there are also entrenched uh, beliefs and perceptions of radiation risk and screening and biopsies and I don't want to know that I got cancer thinking, you know, in, uh, in Asian countries. And uh, this, I think this need public education to overcome and, uh, and uh, get the patients uh, high risk to onto these uh, screening programs. Okay, thank you. All right, so finally we have Dr. David Lam. <laughs> okay, right, the question for you is, do you think that uh, introduction of biomarkers to rule in or rule out lung cancer among patients with indeterminate pulmonary nodules would have tremendous clinical benefit? Yes or no? Um, I would um, view these statements in different parts. I would say introduction of biomarker is definitely yes, good. And um, we always would like to have more tools. Whether they are able to rule in or rule out lung cancer among patients with uh, indeterminate pulmonary, pulmonary nodules is another story that we need to take care of because um, um, that rests on how good these biomarkers are. And so we would like to have um, new tools. That means we would like to have additional biomarkers um, on top of a low-dose CT. And um, again, not blood biomarkers would be good, but we would not limit to it. But um, like those radiological features, they could uh, be evaluated to see how good they are in ruling in and out of lung cancer in that specific population of patients with indeterminate pulmonary nodules. If their performance is good, are of good sensitivity and good specificity, then they, the introduction of these good biomarkers should bring tremendous clinical benefits to our patients in the early detection of lung cancer. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lam. Right, so finally, um, to round up this discussion, right, I would like to um, you know, to know your concluding thoughts on um, what is the utility of, let's say, new biomarkers and models, like lung cancer biomarker panels, uh, which includes um, biomarkers like ProGRP, Cypress 211, SCCCA, uh, in combination with radiology for early detection of lung cancer in high-risk patients, right? So maybe we'll start with Dr. Arjun, you know, do you have any final thoughts on that? I would need more data on that. I need more Indian data on that, whether that works in our population or not. So we all know that these markers have been around for a long period of time. Unfortunately, they're not a part of any of the guidelines as of now. So once, yes, they're validated and they're validated in our population. Because as you know, when you talk about different populations, for example, the Southeast Asian phenotype, where you say 50% of your patients are non-smokers. In my country, 90% of them are actually smokers. We have non-smoker lung cancer, but that's like really minority. So if these markers, this panel has been validated in our country, we have Indian data to support it, why not? Okay, thank you. So uh, Dr. Darren Lim, right, your thoughts? Uh, I think this potentially useful. Um, radiomic models, which were suggested in the one of the talks, um, are reproducible if the same protocol, the same machine, the operator characteristics are, are adopted you know, in, you know, in a broad manner across the different institutions which actually 
apply that model. If you have uh, different uh, ways of in doing that algorithm, you might end up with uh, a different readout. So I think there are limitations to that, to the utility of that radiomics model. Um, so that has to be taken into consideration. Biomarkers may refine, of course, may add on to that uh, equation a bit more. And again, as what uh, David was suggesting, you know, that you know, we really need to have good specificity and fairly good sensitivity for, for such uh, biomarkers for it to be applied broadly. And finally, I think, uh, which is the most challenging part, is actually to uh, the requirement for properly designed and uh, empowered validation studies uh, to, to prove that this uh, combination is actually going to be useful. OK, thank you. So finally, Dr. Lam, your thoughts? Cool. More or less the same as Dr. Khan and Dr. Lim. And I believe these um, newer panels of uh, biomarkers are always uh, potentially useful, and uh, but they need to be um, further validated when they are applied to um, different populations of different risk factor characteristics. And, um, and as mentioned by um, Dr. Khan and Dr. Lim, um, we need further evaluation of these uh, panels as well as their combination use with other panels of biomarkers or um, uh, sometimes have to involve radiomics for clinical features. Okay, great. All right, I think, um, you know, I think that basically sums up very nicely. So uh, I think, you know, if you've gone through the lectures and you've also listened to this um, panel discussion, I believe all of us agree that, um, you know, doing just low dose CT alone um, is good, uh, but, you know, you would like to have additional tools, right, that could help you with the early diagnosis and especially early detection of lung cancer, especially in this part of the world where it's so varied. And uh, in the terms of the use of lung cancer biomarker panels, um, right, you will need more data, especially data specific to your local population, because it appears that there is a population to population variation that needs to be accounted for. Right? Uh, so I think uh, in conclusion, I would like to thank the panelists for taking time off your busy schedules to share with us your expertise uh, and to the audience for joining us today. Right. I hope you have found the session informative and useful. Uh, so with that, um, I'd like to, uh, on behalf of the panelists, wish everyone a good day and stay safe. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. 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 Bye. Bye. Bye.